Hello, Keith Kaiser here with Studies in the Book of Acts. Today we're in Acts chapter 7, beginning our reading at verse 44, and we're continuing Stephen's message to the Sanhedrin, where he's recounting the history of Israel with a very definite thesis, that God has sent them repeated deliverers through history, and very often they've rejected those deliverers and misunderstood what God was doing. And the Lord Jesus is just the culmination of this phenomenon, that he is the deliverer come from God, and yet they've rejected him just like they did Moses and Joseph and others in their history. Verse 44, he says, Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen. So just previous to this, he's been talking about their wanderings in the wilderness and how they no sooner got out of the land of Egypt and they were turning back to idolatry, that they turned to the golden calf. And what's more, that was just the tip of the iceberg. They went on through their history to worship the star of Remphan and to carry the tabernacle of Moloch. And so these uh, pagan forms of religion, these idolatries, were things that were nettlesome stumbling blocks to the nation of Israel through their history. And of course, we know that the Old Testament tells the story of how God called them to repentance repeatedly over and over, sending prophets. And Second Chronicles ends really recounting how even though God had sent them so many prophets, still they refused to hearken. And just as God forewarned them, they were therefore chastised as a nation. His discipline came upon them and they were carried away into 70 years of captivity. We know from Daniel chapter 9 that that prophecy of Jeremiah the prophet was literally fulfilled in Daniel's day, and that uh, we have the account of that generation going back to the land in the time of King Cyrus of Persia, and you can read about that in the early chapters of Ezra, for example. But <clears throat> idolatry, suffice it to say, up until that point, was a repeated problem for Israel. In the New Testament era, they were vociferously against idols. The nation even rioted when the Romans tried to bring in their standards that had idolatrous images on them into the city of Jerusalem, and they didn't want to have these things there. So they were very outwardly zealous against idols, and yet idolatry is a, a really insidious kind of sin. Because what an idol is, is not just something carved or molded or made of wood or stone or precious metals, but it is anything that we put in the place of the true and living God. In other words, it is a substitute deity. So pride can be an idol. Human beings themselves can be idols. Uh, material things and covetousness can be idols. In fact, Colossians chapter 3 says covetousness, which is idolatry. So it equates those sins. Covetousness, the inordinate desire for material things, is just another form of idolatry. Whether you have those things or you wish you had them, you're seeking them or you already possess them, things can take, take hold of your heart. Material things can become idols in one's life. So it's uh, the fact that they were chastised in the Old Testament for their idolatry and carried away into captivity. It's a little bit fallacious to argue that after the captivity, they never struggled with idolatry again. In fact, the idols just went underground. They were less overt, less in your face, more subtle types of idols. And, and those are the sorts of idols that tend to predominate in our Western world today. Humanism and materialistic naturalism, these kind of philosophies, although they would officially negate the idea of a deity, they would say there's no supreme being or no god or gods, yet they deify the forces of nature. And they say that the universe is matter plus time plus chance. That's how we got here. The determining factors of life are, of course, uh, powers of nature, laws of nature, as they'd call them, gravity and the strong atomic force, the weak atomic force and electromagnetism, things like this. But in reality, that's just a more sophisticated form of idolatry. You're taking the glory which belongs to the creator and you're giving it to the creature, to the created thing. And Romans 1 says that lies at the root of idolatry. So Israel's history had been full of idolatry. 
but the true and living God continued to give himself a witness. And verse 44 speaks about that. He says, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. Now the tabernacle to a Jew, Hamishkan in Hebrew, that means the dwelling place, the dwelling place of God. He pitched a tent in their midst. Israel was living in tents in the wilderness and their tents were oriented around the central tent of the Lord's tabernacle. That tabernacle was the place where he presenced himself. His glory dwelt there between the cherubim and many of the Psalms and other parts of the Bible refer to the Lord who sits enthroned between the cherubim, such as in 1 Samuel 4 or Psalm 80. And so that mercy seat above the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies within the tabernacle, that was metaphorically or symbolically, we might say, the throne of God. And therefore, God would presence himself, a pillar of cloud by day or a pillar of fire by night. And Israel could look out of their tent doors, any Israelite, and see that God was in the midst. He was right in the middle of their community. And the centrality of his presence spoke to them of how all life needed to be lived quorum Deo, before the face of God, as the old Reformation slogan is. That they had to be living with that sense of God right in the middle of their lives. That everything they did, said, thought, ought to be to the glory of God, ought to be out of love for God, ought to be with thanksgiving and worship towards God. It not, not was not always so, of course, any more than it is always so with us. And therefore, to approach God at the tabernacle, God instituted the sacrificial system that the first seven chapters of Leviticus go into great detail about. Five categories of main offerings, burnt offering, the meal offering, sometimes called the meat offering or the grain offering, and uh, the third offering is the peace offering, and then the sin offering, and the trespass offering. These last two, very similar, except the trespass offering had um, damages, you might say, that had to be paid. You had to add the fifth part to. And so it spoke not only of sin's corrosive effect, but it spoke of the damage that sin does and had that, how that had to be paid for. In any case, to approach God this system of sacrifices was instituted. And of course, Leviticus 23 tells us there were the feasts of the Lord, these harvest festivals that were scattered through the calendar of Israel so that, again, the rhythms of life would direct them toward the Lord. And uh, every Sabbath day, of course, under the law, they were supposed to stop and have that day of rest, not only for their benefit, but more especially for the worship of God and for reflecting on what God had done for them. In any case, everything in Israel was designed to direct them toward the Lord. And the tabernacle was a witness of the truth about God. You could go there and you could see that outwardly uh, the glories of God in their midst were hidden. It was covered over by these animal skins. And uh, it's much like the Lord Jesus, whom John chapter 1 says of him, the word became flesh and dwelt among us in John 1 14. The word dwelt there is the word to tabernacle, to pitch your tent. And the tabernacle is an excellent picture of what the Lord Jesus did. The son of God in incarnation came and dwelt in the midst of our world, right in the midst of humanity, came down right into the center of things to deal with our issues, especially the central issue of knowing God and what keeps us from knowing God, which is sin. And the Lord Jesus came to deal with sin. He came, as 1 John 3 reminds us, to destroy the works of the devil. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly, as he'd say in the Gospel of John. He came to save the world if we would receive that salvation by faith in him. So this tabernacle of witness that bore witness of who God was, that he was a holy being, that he must be worshipped in the beauty of holiness, that he must be approached carefully. You couldn't just come into God's presence any way you wanted. You had to come by the right sacrifices. You had to come by the way of blood. The first thing you encountered, there wasn't, there weren't, I should say, many ways to God. There was one gate that entered into that tabernacle area. And the brazen altar was there, this altar where the burnt offering was offered and where the other offerings were offered. And so you knew you had to come by sacrifice, that in order to come to God, something had to be done about sin. And since, as Romans 3, um, 
sorry, Romans 6, 23 reminds us the wages of sin is death. So you had to come by the way of death, the death of another, in this case, a substitute. And those animals that were offered at that altar, of course, pictured the one sacrifice that would be accepted by God. Eventually, the sacrifice of the Son of God himself on the cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ, would die there. The Son of Man, Messiah, who was bringing God's purposes to fulfillment and fruition. And then you'd come to the laver, to this large basin, where the priests, before they would enter in to do their holy service in the holy place, they would get water from that laver and wash their hands and their feet. To approach God, there not only had to be cleansing by blood, there not only had to be judicial forgiveness, where we say the penalty has been carried out against sin. Sin has been condemned and judged. And the Lord Jesus died and shed his blood so that penalty might be carried out in him rather than upon us, the sinners who deserved it. But you had to also come to the labor, realizing that the salvation of the Lord Jesus is not just judicial forgiveness. Thanks, God, thanks be to God, it is. We do have justification by faith. We're declared legally righteous in God's sight through the death of the Lord Jesus. His sacrifice provides a forensic pardon, therefore. It's admissible in the divine court of law, you might say, that the record shows we've not only been pardoned and forgiven, but we've been declared positively righteous if we believe on the Lord Jesus. But of course, his salvation involves a washing, and that labor uh, shows us that washing. You had to approach God in purity. <clears throat> and so there's not only judicial forgiveness, there's also cleansing, that when someone comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, as he would describe it in John chapter 13, you are washed all over. Exodus 28 tells us about the inauguration of the priesthood, that on the day when they were set as a, a priest, they would be bathed all over ceremonially. That would only occur once. Thereafter, they'd have to come to that labor every day they showed up to work and wash their hands and feet. In much the same way, a Christian only needs to be saved once. You're born again by faith in Christ, and you are washed. You are sanctified, the Word of God says. And yet, we can we can incur and we do incur defilement in this world. As we walk through this world, we can stumble. Our feet can get dirty. So we need to wash our hands and feet daily before the Lord. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So says First John 1, 9. <coughs> so, excuse me, this walking before the Lord in this world is a walking in light. And yet uh, the Bible is very realistic uh, our hands and feet can be defiled in this world. We can get spiritually dirty and we have to come to the Lord and confess our sins. And the Lord applies that cleansing, that once for all cleansing that already has happened is maintained on a daily basis as we wash our hands and feet before the Lord by faith. Now, the tabernacle then was that tent structure where they went in. And uh, the first part of it was the holy place. Technically, the tabernacle is the holy of holies, the 15 by 15 by 15 foot cube. But the holy place is what led into it. And there were three pieces of furniture in that holy place, the table of showbread and the lampstand and the golden altar of incense. And again, all these things speak of Christ. He is the bread of life, the bread of heaven that a man may eat of and not die. And yet that bread was set on the table, although the priests would eventually get to eat it. For seven days, it wasn't eaten by man. It was appreciated by God. God could look on that table and God could appreciate what that bread was. And also the priests, as they looked on that table, could appreciate the provision and the life that came from God. And there were loaves for all 12 tribes there on that table. And so it spoke of God's complete provision for his people through the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, the lampstand was the one source of light within the holy place. And the Lord Jesus is the light of the world. He is light and in him is no darkness at all. And so he illumines our pathway. He is the one who enlightens us. He gives us light through his word. And he shows us what the truth of God is. And then, of course, the golden altar of incense, incense in the Bible, repeatedly linked, especially in Psalms, with prayer, with 
uh, interceding on behalf of the people of God, praying for them, praying for their needs. That's supplication. Giving thanks to God. That's thanksgiving. Worshiping God. That's being taken up with who he is. Praising God. That's being taken up with what he has done. All of these things done at the golden altar of incense. And they couldn't approach the Lord without that uh, that uh, tissue, so to speak, of incense. That barrier, we might say. That covering that would protect. And only once a year did anyone go behind the veil to the immediate presence of God, into the Holy of Holies. And even there, we stress it was a theophany. It was a manifestation of God's glory. But it wasn't seeing God in his full glory because God is invisible because he's spirit. And also, if a man could see God in his full glory, the Bible assures us he would die. But once a year, the high priest could go in there on the Day of Atonement, as recorded in Leviticus 16, and he could offer blood before and on the mercy seat of that tabernacle, or rather of that Ark of the Covenant. And he would have to go in with that censer of incense, again, providing that barrier between him and even the manifestation of God's glory, even a part of God's glory. There had to be something between him and God. So obviously the tabernacle witnessed to the separation of God from man, that God's different, that he's distinct, that he is higher than we are, much higher, higher than the heavens, the Bible says, that he is God most high, and he has to be approached reverently. And this was given to them as a witness, not only a witness to Israel, but a witness to the nations that God was in their midst. So he speaks here about our fathers, their ancestors, having the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. Imagine God coming down and dwelling in the midst of his people in a desert. Uh, Stephen Alford titled his book about the tabernacle, Camping with God. Now, uh, it wasn't quite camping, but uh, in the sense that we think of as something recreational, this is where they were living. But think of how God condescended to be in the midst of his people. And think of how much more the Lord Jesus Christ was manifest in the flesh, how the Son of God came to live amongst us to show us what God was like and ultimately to bring us to God by dealing with our sin and putting it away by the sacrifice of himself. And because he's risen again from the dead, he can give eternal life to those who believe on him. Indeed, if you haven't trusted Christ yet, I would beseech you to trust in the Lord Jesus. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It requires repentance, seeing yourself as God sees you, changing your mind about how your life's been hitherto, that you are a sinner in need of a salvation, that God is holy and just and good, and that he has every right to send you to hell, and yet that salvation is in Christ. There's no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved, Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells us. So you can come to the Lord Jesus and be saved. He's called Jesus because it says he shall save his people from their sins. Indeed, come to Jesus today. Thank you for listening.